How can I know eternal life? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Pursuit, a Cross Point City Church podcast that pursues a deeper dive into the scripture from last week's sermon. I'm Pastor Lane Vrooman here with Pastor James Griffin. Now, before we get started, I want to give a special shout out to our listeners in Montgomery, Alabama. Let's go, man. Right? You know much about Montgomery? Not not a ton. You know, right before the podcast, we were just talking about how like a lot of the civil rights uh, movement there were just some significant happenings that took place in and around Montgomery, but I'm not super familiar. I've driven through it. Yeah. I've, I think I've been there once or twice, but not super familiar. Well, you're about to get more familiar, <laughs> all right? Enlighten me, Lane. Okay, here you go. Montgomery is the birthplace of tons of notable people, but here are a few that I think you might know. People like Octavia Spencer. I know that name. From The Help. Okay, yep. I don't. You don't know that name? No, but I'm... Lane, I'm come al- on. Have you seen The Help? Have you seen the movie? No, is that? Oh, no. come on, bro. Movie? Yeah, you got to watch that movie. Yeah, it's really good. Came out, I don't know how many years ago, but it's it's worth watching. Yeah, you need to check it out. Okay, The Help. I'll have to check that out. All right. When you see her, I think you'll recognize her. It's probably one of those deals. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, you're probably right. All right. Musicians, <laughs> Nat King Cole. All right. You know and that guy. And Hank Williams. Yes. I okay. know those right, people. Right. Okay. And author Harper Lee, yep. who authored To Kill a Mockingbird. Did you have to read that in high school? Uh, I don't think so, but. Okay. But. All right. I was um, Jim, whatever. I think I forget the last name. At a, it was like a, a play, a community okay. play in Marietta when For I was this? like. For this? To kill, to kill a mockingbird, and you were in the play. Yeah. Like, okay. You know what? A lot of people don't know this about you, Lane. You do have an acting background, don't you? I, I, I have. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have a little bit of a past. Okay, for yeah. for all of our listeners, Lane Vrooman was in a movie once. Oh please! Oh my gosh. <laughs> what was the name of the movie, Lane? Um. It's do you called even what, remember? It's called What the Jeff. What the Jeff. Can we find you on IMDb? I, I I would like to think so, but no, I don't think so. No, my buddy Skyler like produced it, yeah. directed it. He wrote a lot. He's a really talented guy. Okay. Um, and I think he's still pumping stuff out. All right. Or or has, um. So yeah. But but yeah. I, so Lane Vroom and Google him. See if you can find the See, clip. Yeah, exactly. From what and if it's Jeff. not, then just create one. I've seen a clip somewhere i don't remember how i saw it but i did see it lane and it was pretty incredible yeah so i actually i was in this independent film all right called too shy to be a vampire it was a vampire that was too shy to like bite someone and and i don't even know how i got into this my friends were extras i was an extra listen this dude it never got made did Okay, were, who think. were you? Were you the too shy vampire guy? No, no. Who I was, comes up with an idea like this? I have no idea, dude. That is amazing. A vampire world, too shy to buy yeah, someone. Yeah, I, I was like an extra sitting at a table with a mask on, and it was so long ago. It was so <laughs> so strange. I don't know how we got off onto that. I, I but know. I know. Yeah, he, I. He, I'm just honored that I can sit here at the table table with an actor of your caliber and your quality wow. lane. So. It is an honor to be in your presence today, my friend. What oh, the Jeff? Thank you. What, yes. Google it. Yes. See if you can find that clip. I'll give you an autograph after. I appreciate the recording. that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, listen, our friends in Montgomery, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. So, James, this this past week we started in John 17. That's right. And so, can you give us a quick summary for for anyone who might have missed it? Yes. Yes. So, I preached a sermon this weekend called "This Is Eternal Life." And I titled it that because that is what Jesus uh, talks about in the text. He actually Mm -hmm. uses that phrase, and this is eternal life. So we talked about eternal life according to Jesus, what it is and what it means. And, you know, I I talked briefly in the sermon about what we think of when we think of eternal life. I think if you ask most people to describe eternal life, they would talk about streets of gold Mm -hmm. and angels and being reunited with loved ones and the absence of sin and pain and death and and so most people think about eternal life as living in a place forever, but Jesus defines eternal life as knowing a person mm. forever. And this person is the one true God, right? Uh, the creator of all things, the maker of heaven and earth. 
And so eternal life is you and I knowing that God perfectly forever. And what makes that life possible is the finished work of Jesus on our behalf. The fact that he left glory and he put on humanity and he accomplished the work of saving sinners like you and me by his life, his death, his resurrection. And so we unpacked all that and, and talked about our response, right? Our response to the finished work of Jesus is that we work, mm -hmm. that, that we put in work and that our supreme motivation for that work is the very glory of God. And, and glorifying God, as I explained, isn't us adding something to him that he doesn't already possess. Yeah, that was good. God is glorious regardless of what we do or don't do, but, but we are here to put God on display, mm -hmm. to make his greatness known, to make his beauty known, so that ultimately we can reach the end of our lives and say to him with confidence what Jesus said in his prayer, God, I glorified you on the earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. And so we just talked about how to finish well and what that means and, and making the glory of God the greatest concern of our lives. I mean, that's what it means to be like Christ is, is that we would live, live for the glory of God above all things. And, and praise God, one day we're going to share in that glory. We're going to be with Christ in eternity, and, and we're going to know the same glory that he now knows in the presence of God the Father, mm. which is our hope as believers in Christ. And so knowing what he has done for us and what he's accomplished it should motivate us to live the life that we've been created and safe to live. And I'll even add this one thing I didn't talk about in the sermon is the fact that eternal life doesn't start when we die, but eternal life starts in the moment we put our faith in Jesus as yeah. Savior and Lord, right? That's awesome. and, and that's another misconception that I think are, are, uh, exists in the minds of people is that, well, eternity starts when I breathe my last. Hmm. It's like, no, man, e eternity started for you when Jesus breathed new life into you when he brought you out of spiritual death and gave you spiritual life and brought you into the family of God. So if you know him, eternal life has already started for you. And again, eternal life is you and I knowing the one true God. So yeah, yeah that, that's so good. I love, I love how that should inspire how we live our lives. Like I yeah. thought it was incredibly powerful. You know, when you're talking about, man, when you, when you see Jesus face to face, mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that matters is, is essentially how you reflected him right and his character to to our world and i know that 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 hit me heavily because it's just so easy it's so easy to get distracted yeah you know yeah. what i mean it's yeah. so easy to chase the stuff it is whatever the stuff is. and at the end of the day yep it is a uh, it's a waste it is it because is. the only thing that matters is, is again, uh, reflecting God's glory to our world. Yeah. And that's actually where our joy is found. That's so right. I, I feel like the way you unpack that was, was super helpful. Mm. Um, yeah, well, to, I mean, just to piggyback on what you said, all other glories are fleeting glories. Mm. There is one glory that is eternal. There is one glory that lasts. It is the glory of God. It's the only glory worth living for. That's right. And the only way to know purpose is to live for that glory. Exactly. And I don't want to talk more about that in a little bit. So well, that's I'll, awesome. I'll save, I'll save more thoughts for when we get there. Well, good. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Well, listen, as you're talking about uh, uh, eternity, yeah. you, know, you, you talked about heaven and almost how people can treat heaven almost like a product right. or a good or a service, something to benefit them. So... Can, can you talk a little bit about that transactional Christianity? Can you yeah. talk about some of the dangers and, and just how has this become yeah. so prevalent in our world? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I use the, the um, description transactional Christianity on purpose because I do think that this is how a lot of people treat Jesus. It's like, I'm just going to use yeah. Jesus to get what I want from mm -hmm. Jesus. I don't really want him. I just want what he can do for me. I want all of his benefits. I want all of his blessings. You know, we started the sermon this week with this Piper clip, yeah, you know, it's it like, hey, so if, if you could have heaven and Jesus wasn't there, would it be okay? And my fear is that for a lot of people, mm -hmm. if they were honest, they would have to answer yes. As long as I can have all the blessings and all the benefits, I'm fine if I don't have him. This is transactional Christianity. And I was just thinking about examples of this and, and how we do this. And I think we're probably all guilty of this on some level, mm -hmm. you know? But I, I thought about the prosperity gospel. This is a great example of transactional Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it's such garbage and it's a false gospel. And I hate it, like despise it with every fiber mm -hmm. of my being. 
but but prosperity gospel i mean the prosperity gospel it teaches people to think in in these terms that if you will obey God and if you will follow the commandments of God, that God will bless you with health, wealth, and prosperity. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get sick and all your bills are going to be paid and you're going to be victorious in every area of life. And so what it does is it trains people to use God to get what they really want from God. It's like, I don't want him. I just want to leverage him. So if I can leverage him by doing the things that he wants me to do so that I can get what I really want, well, I'll, I'll do that. That's yeah. a transaction. I put in work so that God will give me what I want. I do the right thing so that God will bless me with certain things. It's a transaction. Did you, I sent you that text this past week. Okay. From the beach. You were, I don't know. You were, that, or, you were no, no, maybe it, right? it was the week before. Okay. I think it was the week before. And it was of that prosperity oh, that teacher. Was, dude, I was dying. I was dude, laughing. I mean, in yeah. this, this is a guy, I really don't know his name, but I mean, the dude is talking about, his 40,000 40, square, square foot, foot mansion yeah, 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 yeah. that he had tried sick and it just did, it just didn't work sick for him. didn't work for him and, and his I family. Just, yeah. I mean that, you know, yeah, I feel like anger is, uh, I, I sharing that with you yeah. just because, you know, we talk to so many people, yeah. God fearing, amazing, mature Christians mm-hmm. that their story is far different from that. And so the fact Absolutely. that that gets, propagated is so it, it's such a false teaching it's so dangerous yeah. and so damaging it is it's a, and and you're saying what are some of the dangers that's it yeah like you're setting people up for failure man mm. it's like go, go try to preach that message in the middle of you know some country where people are still having their heads cut off for their faith in christ yeah. and see how that works yeah you know, a gospel that can't be preached everywhere is a false gospel. Yeah, that's good. And you just got to remember that. But, you know, I was thinking about other examples. I think people do this with relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, well, if I if I do the right things, maybe God will fix my marriage. Mm-hmm. Or if I do all the right things, maybe that person will finally date me. People do it when it comes to to work or finances. It's like, all right, maybe if I obey God and participate in his church in certain ways, you know, the money thing will work out or, or the promotion will happen at work. People do it with parenting. Maybe if I do the right things, my kids won't act like sinful little heathens. And, and again, it's all an attempt to use God to get what I really want from God. It's idolatry is what it is. And, and people, to the point that I made earlier, people do it all the time with heaven. The example that I gave, Lane, was all the people here in the religious South, and I know a lot of these people. I grew up around mm. a lot of these people. I mean, I've been in ministry now for, gosh, 22 years, so I've seen this happen a lot. Um, people who pray prayers to stay out of hell, right. and then they live like hell, right. and nothing ever changes in their life. And, and you know, one of the questions you ask is, why has this become so prevalent? And I think the church is largely to blame, okay? And I don't want this to turn into a, ba- uh, a church bashing session, because I'm a guy who loves the church mm-hmm. deeply. I mean, the church is the bride of Christ. We are the people of God. He gave his life up to, to redeem the church. So in no way do I want to badmouth the church. But I do think that, that culturally here in the United States of America, over the last few decades maybe, the church has done some things. And I'm, I'm using the church. In yeah, a, general, I'm not sure. saying every church, but sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying some things have happened in the church that have contributed to this, all right? I I just noted a couple. Number one, I do think that there has been a great emphasis on the place over knowing the person. Mm. Okay, eternal life, again, it's not about getting to a place, it's about knowing a person. But I even think about my church experience growing up. All I ever heard about was the place. Yeah, Eternal life was about getting to a place. It wasn't about knowing the one true God. I'll give you an example. Like I remember evangelism training that I went through as a student and I was probably in high school when we did this, we would go out on Tuesday nights and we would do visitation in neighborhoods. So we were the people knocking on doors, you know, interrupting people's dinners, tracks running from their doors and closing the blinds, acting like they weren't home. Yeah, that's what I do. We were these people. But here was the question we were trained to ask, okay? Do you know where you're going when you die? Mm -hmm. Do you know where you're going when you die? And in large part, that was evangelism. Like in the church, at least 
in my experience, it was all about a place. Do you know what place you're, nobody wants to go to hell, right? I mean, that sounds terrible. Sure. Everybody yeah. wants to go to heaven. Do you know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Well, here's how you can know. Just pray this prayer and repeat after me and you can have heaven when you die. And there was very, very little talk about right. knowing the person, being in relationship with the living God. And so I do think that we have in some ways trained people to think that way. And I don't know that it was done on purpose, but it's been done. Right. It's been done. And so I think that's one. You want to add anything? Well, before I, I just think, I mean, and, and underneath that, and again, I, I, I agree that it, this hasn't been intentional, certainly not malicious, but it's a very um, fear-based approach. I right. mean, you have Jesus who is the, the most beautiful person yeah. with, with the most beautiful grace and yep. love and mercy. And so you can't really have a legitimate relationship that's grounded in fear because it's right. not really a relationship you want to be in. Yeah, You really just don't want to tick off the other party, which right, you, you right, know what right. I mean? So there's yeah. a lot underneath that. And that, yep. that's, that's been my experience yeah. as well. So yeah. Well, John says perfect love drives out fear, that's right? Exactly right? So when yeah. you're in right relationship with God, yeah. I mean, we have a healthy fear of God, but we don't have the kind of fear that you're talking exactly, about. So, yeah. you know, the other thing that I noted is that I think in a lot of churches, decisions have been emphasized over disciples, mm. that decisions have been emphasized over disciples. So the idea is like, man, if we can just get people saved right. and celebrate the fact that we have gotten people saved, man, that's, that's good enough. And then we stop short and we fail to really shape people into the people that Christ saved them to be. I'll even say it this way. I think in a lot of churches, evangelism has become an idol. Mm. So in an effort, let me explain what I mean. In an effort to convert people, we try to make Christianity as attractive as possible. All right, what's all the good stuff that we can pitch people to make them want this? Yeah. Uh, hey, we, we got to get people making decisions, right? And so we talk about all the good things and the heavenly things, and we talk about the place and the blessings and all the benefits. And then there are churches that don't talk about the hard things. Mm -hmm. And they don't talk about the offensive things, and they don't bring up sin, or they don't bring up judgment, or the wrath of God, or they don't talk about hell, or they don't talk about what it really means to surrender all areas of life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that if we really want to be a disciple, we must deny ourselves, take up our yeah, crosses right. daily, and follow after Jesus. And so we do people a huge disservice when, when we make it about decisions and not discipleship. It's almost like we treat Jesus as the genie in a bottle, you know? Yeah. It's like, all right, here he, he wants to grant all of your wishes, and if you will do these things and live this life, he will take care of you. And again, I don't want to turn this into a church bash session. That is not my heart, but I think it's why a lot of churches preach the same sermon series every year. It's like, all right, we're going to talk about marriage and we're going to talk about money and we're going to talk about relationships mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about parenting and we're going to, and it's all the felt need stuff. And I'm not saying that there's not a need for that. I think there's a place and a need for that in the life of the church, okay? Right. But when it's only ever about that, all right, here are the things that Jesus wants to help you with. And, and if you'll do these things, you can have his help. And, and again, it's that, it's that evangelism as an idol. It's the it's the setting up Jesus as the person to be used so that I can get what I really want from him. And I just want to say again, that is not Christianity. Mm. Christianity was never meant to be transactional. Christianity is relational. Christianity is about you and I knowing the one true God and then living lives to make him known. Mm. And if we're going to live lives to make him known, this means that we become disciples of Christ in every way. Yeah. That we're shaped by the Holy Spirit, that we lay our lives down in full surrender, um, that we don't use Jesus to get what we want from Jesus. We just go hard after Jesus and we trust him and we obey him and we follow him. And outside of that, I mean, we let the chips fall where they may, you know? And so this is, this is, I think, again, one of the great dangers is that when we fail to really preach Christianity, we, we set people up to be disappointed. Yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and you don't give them the space and the opportunity and the investment to grow and to mature in their faith. Because yeah. if the goal is ever just a decision, yeah. then first of all, you have people like me who for many years of my youth, I mean, dude, I was surrendering my life to Christ every <laughs> Sunday, bro. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, all right, well, yeah. let's just, you yeah, know. Yeah, that's right. But, but what that underneath that is, I, I didn't understand 
assurance or, yeah. or you know, that, that God was giving me a gift that he was going to sustain right. that I wasn't. And right. so when, when it's just so focused on a, on a decision, you have people that are stuck and yeah. never, never continue to grow and be discipled yeah. and, and really live out their, That's right. uh, their calling that God has given yeah. them. So, yeah. Well, listen, as, as you continue to work through John 17, uh, we saw that, that Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven yeah. to speak to the Father. So why is it that we typically uh, pray with, and as you joked, which yeah. is right, <laughs> heads bowed and eyes closed? Yeah, well, I, you know, I talked for, I, I don't know, it was really briefly just about posture mm-hmm. and the importance of posture as we come into the presence of God. And, and I am a big believer that posture matters and that our body language says something about our belief in God. So I, you know, I took a moment to talk about lifting hands in worship mm-hmm. and the significance of that and, and bowing our knees in prayer, just, just humbling ourselves in that way and remembering how small we really are mm-hmm. as we encounter God's presence. You know, I was thinking about how at times I've, I've asked people in moments to, to open their hands yeah. up before the Lord and almost to take on a receiving posture, you know, and, just to be able to say to him in a very physical way, God, I, I want whatever you want to give me. Mm-hmm. Whatever you want to say to me today, I want to receive that. So I, I do think that posture matters. And I think that what we probably both grew up with in church, you know, heads bowed, eyes closed, that is a posture, I believe, of reverence. Right. I think it's a, a, a posture of, of worship, a posture of, of maybe just standing in stillness and in awe in the presence of God. And I do think that type of reverence is really, really important when we encounter God. I mean, there are many moments where I think it is very appropriate to bow and to close eyes and to be still, mm-hmm. right? So I don't want to discount that in any way. I was just trying to make the point that's not the only way to pray, right? Right. And, and I think that there are people who believe that, well, if you're not praying in that way, somehow you're sinning, you know? Like if it's your hand slap for looking around during a prayer, like why do you have your eyes open Dude, right I, now? I used to be the prayer police. My parents still talk about it where I'd go and I'd uh, have my hands folded and I'd be like, I see you closer. <laughs> you were the guy slapping I it. Was. That's I, so hey, funny. I was. I thought it was important. That's so, so just shaming people in, <laughs> yeah, exactly. in moments I, of prayer. I know. Oh, Lane, I love that. That's so funny. But no, I, I was just thinking about what I have seen and experienced like personally or in other places. I, I've been in cultures in other parts of the world where the normal thing is for people to to look up and to lift their hands mm. in prayer. So it's the exact opposite yeah. of what we do here, places in Africa and South America where people literally lift hands and look to the sky and pray, mm-hmm. right? Heads bowed, eyes closed, not yeah. the only way to pray. I was thinking about uh, Burkina Faso and all the time that I've spent there, this little country in West Africa. And at times we'll talk about praying Burkina style and praying Burkina style, man, was where everybody kind of gets in a big huddle and you just let loose and everybody's praying out loud at the same time, nice. just going for it. And then once everybody kind of starts to come to a close, one person buttons up the prayer and puts a bow on it and prays out loud. And and so I love how yeah, they pray. That's awesome. You know, it's just, it's intense. Yeah. And, and I love experiencing prayer like that at times where you just know everybody's pulling in the same direction in prayer. It's that's super right. good. Um, I've had experiences where I personally have just prayed prostrate on the ground, Mm -hmm. face down. It's almost like that Isaiah 6 moment where (laughs) he falls on his face in the presence of God. I remember years ago, I did a prayer retreat. It was the very first prayer retreat I ever did at a monastery in Conyers with my friend Peter Grant. And I just remember we spent part of that prayer day prostrate on the Mm. ground, man. Just face down, fully laid out in the presence of God and it's powerful. It's like, I don't know, you know, it's one of those moments where like, okay, how low can I get yeah. in his presence? And I think there's great power in that at times. I was thinking about how I've taken prayer walks. You ever done a prayer walk, Lane? I'm sure you have. Yeah. What about a prayer run? You ever been praying when you're running? Yeah. Okay. I hadn't titled it that way, but it turned out to be yeah. running yeah. and talking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, dude, a few weeks ago, I was up early on a Thursday and I, I usually try to get up early on Thursdays, get my day started, mm-hmm. finish up sermon prep for that night. But I went out to Sam Smith for a run and I usually have my earbuds in, listening to something, right. podcast music. And on this particular Thursday, I'm like, I'm just going to pray. Yeah. So I ran for like 30, 40 minutes and just prayed as I ran. 
again, the point is you don't have to have your heads bowed and eyes That's closed right. to pray. I'll even do this in my truck at times because, you know, with a family and three young kids at home, sometimes it's hard to find quiet space to pray. I can imagine. So sometimes in my truck, I'll just leave everything off. There's no radio. There's no podcast going and I'll drive and pray. Mm -hmm. And you can't really close your eyes to do that because, you know, that's highly dangerous. Right. I would advise everyone, keep your eyes open when you're driving, but you can still pray. Yeah. And so the important thing, here's really what I'm trying to drive at. The important thing is that we pray. Right. Okay. Right. The most important thing is not how you pray in terms of posture. There's different ways to do that. The important thing is that we pray. As I said in the sermon, prayer is how we access the help of God. It is how we offload our cares to God, and it's how we remain fixed on the glory of God. Mm. So here's the implication of that. If you don't pray, you are refusing the help of God. Mm. So think about that, man. A refusal to pray is a refusal to accept God's help into your life. It's, it's you saying to God by prayerlessness, God, I don't want you. God, I don't need you. I'm fine on my own. And the reality is we are not fine on our own, okay? Right. Uh, we are all finite beings who have breaking points. And if you don't pray, man, like it's you in your own strength. And that is very dangerous. It also means that you're shouldering all of your cares and all of your anxieties by yourself. Mm -hmm. God of the universe has invited us to come to him and to cast those things on him we do that through prayer. And so when we fail to pray, it's like we're carrying all that stuff by ourselves without the help of God. And then finally, the glory of God is nowhere on our radar. Mm. And you alluded to this a moment ago, but you know, the, the very purpose of our lives is to live for the glory of God. If we don't pray and the glory of God is not on our radar, we miss out on that purpose. Right. Prayerlessness prevents our purpose. And so if we don't pray, then we're probably gonna live for our glory or for the fleeting glories of the world because our perspective is off. So the implications of not praying are huge. Yeah. Prayer matters immensely. And I would encourage you to take on whatever posture God leads you to take on in the moment. But yeah. again, the important thing is that you pray. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a really good perspective because a lot of times it's easy to be like, you know, whoops, I forgot to pray, <laughs> I should do that. But yeah. really you take on the perspective of missing the very purpose of your life. Yeah, that's right. That, that's that's that happens through prayerlessness. That's right. And and again, like you spoke to, we are finite, weak human beings that are should be solely dependent yeah. on on God and God alone. Yeah. And so so to that end, knowing that that we are weak, yep. that we are finite, that we suffer, you actually spoke to that and uh, had talked about Paul when he's talking about having yeah. a thorn in his side. And, and, and Paul says that, that he is actually going to boast in his weakness. So yep. what does it mean to boast in your weakness and how can we do that in our own lives? Yeah. Yeah. So I spoke to second Corinthians 12 for just a bit in the sermon. That's one of those passages that has been a go-to for oh, me yeah. over the years. I'll, I mean, I'll talk about that in a moment and maybe Lane, you could share a little bit of your, mm -hmm. your background and your story as well. But yeah, this passage has had a profound impact on my life. Second Corinthians 12 is where Paul, the apostle Paul, talks about this thorn in his flesh. We have no idea what the thorn was. Mm -hmm. There's been all kinds of yeah. speculation over the centuries from scholars and believers. We simply don't know, mm -hmm. okay? What we do know from the text is its effect on Paul's life, that this thorn made him feel very, very weak, okay? Very, very needy. We know its source. He, he said that this was a messenger of Satan mm. sent to harass him, okay? And we also know its purpose, that it was for his humility. I mean, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. Right. One of the greatest evangelist church planners, Christians the world has ever known. This was a dude, like right before he talks about this whole thorn, he talks about this revelation he received, being mm -hmm. caught up to heaven and having this unbelievable experience with God. And, and then he talks about how this thorn was meant for his humility. Mm. Uh, this thorn was in his life to prevent him from falling into pride. And so he talks about how on three different occasions, so three different seasons of life, he prayed that God would remove it and God said no. I'm not gonna remove it. My grace will be sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now, I think if we're being honest, we all know what it feels like to have a thorn like this. Mm -hmm. And I think these thorns are different for different people. For some of us, it's a temptation. For some of us, it's an addiction. 
For some of us, it might even be an emotion. For some of us, it's an insecurity. But what it means to boast in those thorns, whatever they may be, is that we would see these things as blessings and not burdens. Mm. That we would start to recognize these as, as gifts from God in a way, okay? And I'll share a personal story here to try to make sense of it. Chime in with yours here mm-hmm. in a few minutes too, but I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get real vulnerable and honest, okay? Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of years of my life where this, this thorn was in my flesh called pornography, mm-hmm. like struggled deeply. I was never the guy that struggled with um, drugs or alcohol or anything like that. My issues were anger and lust. Mm-hmm. I got in a lot of fights growing up and you know the whole pornography thing was an issue. I still remember when I saw pornography for the first time, I was probably in elementary school mm-hmm. and my cousin and I found my granddad's Playboys in the basement of his house. And it was one of those moments where I knew like, I shouldn't be looking at this, mm-hmm. but I really wanna look at this, you know? And, and from there it was like, it just, yeah. it just got its claws in me. Yeah. And I can remember as a young man feeling so much guilt and so much shame over this struggle in my life. And I was the young man who would just constantly be at the altar confessing and repenting and God, I'll never do it again. And then, you know, a week later you do it again. And, and so I remember many, many seasons of praying, God, take this from me. God, I don't want to be tempted in this way. I don't want to struggle in this way. And I just remember the season where God finally said, no. Mm. I'm, I'm not gonna remove that temptation. And it was like he said to me what he said to Paul, my grace will be sufficient for you and my power will be made perfect in weakness. And, and again, he used 2 Corinthians 12 as part of this process to really shift my perspective. Here's what he ultimately showed me through that, that, that text, that the temptation and the struggle with pornography, that temptation was the one thing in my life keeping me very, very desperate for him. Like it was that struggle that was forcing me into his presence. It was that struggle that was causing me to cry out for his power. And here's what I realized. If God removes that temptation from my life, I won't need him as much as I need him right now. Mm -hmm. Like what what else in my life is going to force me into his presence to say, God, I need you. Mm -hmm. I need need you to show up. I, I need you to give me the power to put this thing to death. And so I remember coming out of of that moment and that season of prayer and just deciding, I'm gonna boast in this. Mm. Instead of whining about this and complaining about this and, oh, I just wish God would take this away, uh, I'm gonna boast in it. Because as Paul says in the text, when I am weak, then I am strong. I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me and I can speak from experience and say, and it has, and it has. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, man, this is full disclosure. My wife knows this about me. Our elders here at Cross Point City Church know this about me. Now everybody that's listening to the podcast knows this yeah. about me, but uh, God has never taken that temptation away from me completely. Mm. The temptation to look, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't tell you with integrity today, sitting across the table lane, that since I prayed that prayer and had that moment with the Lord that I've never been tempted. Right. I, I can't sit here and say that. What I can say is that the God is that God has given me power to put that sin to death. That's good. And I can say to all the men and women who are listening to this podcast today who struggle with pornography, there is freedom to be found, praise God. Mm. But you might have to change your perspective. Yeah. You might have to stop whining about it as this burden in your life and you start seeing it as this gift that God has has blessed you with because that's the thing driving you to him. And as long as you will go to him and ask for his presence and ask him for the power that you need, he will give you what you need to kill that Mm -hmm. thing. But again, like, let's be honest, man. The thorns that live in us, if if God took them, we wouldn't need him nearly as much as we need him. And I think they're there to remind us of just how much we need the Lord. That's that's absolutely right. I I appreciate you sharing that. Even sharing the fact that this is something that you have to continue to wrestle with. And, and it, it's the same thing that is true for, for any of us. Mine is very specifically in the, the lane of, of drugs and, and alcohol. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've heard a lot of stories, even really within, I, you know, the Christian world or the church, however you want to kind of define that, where 
somebody just got delivered. Yeah, yeah. Man, they, whatever. <laughs> they went to an altar. They prayed yeah, a prayer. Right. That was not my experience. Yeah. Dude, getting sober yeah. was one of the most vicious fights in my life. Mm. And there are still days to yep. today knowing the death and the destruction that it brought on my life mm -hmm. that I think, you know what? Maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. Yep. You know what? Maybe now, yep. maybe I was an addict and then now <laughs> I'm going to be, a, you know, I love now, that. Now I can we handle like, it. Yeah, yeah. Now, now yep. we're going to kind of go back. Yeah, one or two wouldn't be so bad. But you know, I I know where that I know where that leads. Mm -hmm. um, when my addiction had gotten so significant in my life, dude, I just remember for a long season, dude, I would just cry myself to sleep. Yeah, I was just, yeah. I felt powerless. And um, and and as a believer, as I had given my life to Christ, I was still waging war, dude. And it was like just getting through the day sober was like yeah. brutal. Yeah. So. Yep. So hard. And I just remember thinking like, like grieving that part. Like I'm never going to have fun again. Like right, everybody right. gets to go yep. to what, whatever, watch the Georgia game. They're right. going to have a few beers. And I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do that. And so I too said, God, please, yeah. would you just take it? Would you take it? Yeah. Um, that compiled with just my entire life, basically <laughs> just burning to the ground, um, brought me to a place where, where what you said became my reality mm. that there are there are scars from that season in my life that that are still prevalent yeah that are reminders that I am so so grateful that God reminded me that I am weak yeah yep Dude, I spent a long time trying to nurse the mm -hmm. ego, trying to nurse the whatever. That's an exhausting game. When it you is. can when you can recognize yep. God for who he is yep. and and me for who I am as as a broken sinful person. Um dude, there's so much freedom in that. There is. There there's is. so much freedom in that. And so yeah, I, and I I'll just say this as a follow up to what you said and and what I said like sometimes humiliation mm -hmm should be our first prayer. That's right. You know what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, dude? Like yeah. so, sometimes your thing just needs to fail. That's right. Like, you know, I, That's whatever right. yeah. it is, yeah. like it needs to, and, and, and in that way you will be brought to your knees and, and that will actually have an eternal significance. That's right. hundred percent. The no. Yep. The no. Yeah. Sometimes we need more no's. <laughs> we do. You know what I'm we saying? Well, so we that's do. so well, yeah. And, and you're stepping all over something that I said in the sermon, and I was going to repeat. Just this idea that God is attracted to weakness, mm. right? And I think that I think the lie that the enemy is so good at getting us to believe is that we can manage that that's thing. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we can overcome it, or we can fix it, or you know, even when what you alluded to is like. And, or even you can go back to it and yep. still be okay. Sure. You know, no problem. Sure. Uh, but, but he's so good at convincing. No, you, you just need to be stronger. Mm. You just need to put in more effort. Because if you will be stronger and put in more effort, you can beat that. And then what happens is you don't. And it overcomes you. And it overtakes you again. And, and it's so frustrating. It's just this vicious cycle yeah. that you fall into. And again, I just remember it from my own personal life. It's like... You know, you, you fall into sin and then you experience guilt and shame and you promise God you're never going to do it and again. The, the and you put, and you put in, you put in human effort sure. oh, yeah. and for a very short time you do okay. Mm -hmm. And then you break mm -hmm. and it starts all over again. Yeah. And, and, and you know, what's crazy. That cycle is not only dangerous because it can just be perpetual in nature, but, but don't be fooled. Sin is always growing. Yeah. So not only you don't just maintain sin. That's right. Oh, it wants more ground, man. That's exactly right. It it, it yep. wants more energy. Yep. Wants more of your love. Yep. So you you stay in that cycle long enough, you get deeper, you yeah. get darker. Yep. The places get scarier and scarier. That's right. This is why this is so important. That's right. Well, I think it was John Owen who said, "You got to kill sin before it kills you." Mm -hmm. That's right. And so it is a fight. It is a battle, and and the only way to put sin to death is to do what we're talking about, mm -hmm. Lane and to boast in the fact that we are weak people, needy people, dependent people, to rejoice in those weaknesses, 
because those weaknesses are the very things that drive us into the presence of God. And, and the presence of God is where we find power to put sin to death. Yeah. I don't know. I just hope somebody is is encouraged by this conversation yeah. today. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have talked to so many people, I know you have too, over my years in ministry, who I know feel weak and broken, mm-hmm. but they're just redirecting that in the wrong way or to the wrong places or mm-hmm. to the wrong people. And I just want to repeat what I said over the weekend. If you're feeling weak today, you are in the perfect position to be strengthened yeah, by God. Good, and what you need to do is to boast in that weakness, whatever it is, so that the power of Christ may rest upon you. Just keep pressing into mm-hmm. his presence. Mm-hmm. Keep chasing after him. His grace will be sufficient for you. I promise you that. Oh, yeah. There's 100% promise. of the yeah. time. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Man, that's so good. Well, so knowing... And, and, and even following up to talking about how acknowledging our weakness is going to drive us into the presence of God. Well, uh, a large vehicle of that is through is through our prayer. Mm-hmm. So, so with that, then how how can we make sure yeah. that that God's glory, that His greatness, that His renown are the theme of our prayers? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. And here's my first thought: before those things can become themes of our prayer lives. They have to become themes of our lives, Mm. right? So I I think we got to back up and ask that question. Is the glory of God the theme of my life? Because if it's not the theme of your life, it won't be the theme of your prayer life, okay? Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what we've been talking about a little bit. We, We have to understand first and foremost that living for the glory of God is our purpose. Mm. We see it in Genesis 1, right, where God creates all things and he makes our first two parents, Adam and Eve, and he gives them dominion, he gives them authority, calls them to rule and reign over creation on his behalf, tells them to be fruitful, to multiply, and and God created humanity to be his representatives here on the earth. You know, it's like in the ancient world where where kings would set up statues in the lands that they ruled over Mm -hmm. so that people would know that those lands belong to them. This is what God did with humanity in his world. Mm -hmm. He created the world, And he set us up as people to represent him so that the world would know this place belongs to God, Mm -hmm. okay? And so the very purpose of our lives is to fill the earth with his glory. Now, as I explained, that does not mean that we're adding something to him that he does not already possess. All right, God is glorious regardless of, of what we do or what we don't do. Living for his glory just means that we're making him visible in his world, that we are putting his supreme greatness, his all-satisfying beauty on display. We're living lives that reveal him, that that make him known. And so I was thinking about this. You know, I touched on creation in the sermon because I was suffering in Wyoming. You were suffering at the beach last week. I was, I was. But I did see that picture, and that was pretty awesome. Oh, yes. And you're right. I'm yeah. sure that only did one one-thousandth oh, of what that no ju- actually was in that no moment. No justice. Yeah. yeah, the picture I showed in the sermon did it no justice. So you're at the beach standing beside the mm-hmm. ocean that God created. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in Wyoming in the middle of this massive canyon on this trout stream that God created. And as I'm there, and I'm sure as you were at the beach, like, you know, it's hard not to sit back and go, man, look how big he mm-hmm. is. And look how beautiful this is. And that God has put his character and his divine power on display through creation. But he also did it through Christ. Mm. You know how Christ, the eternal son of God, came into the world as the visible manifestation of God's glory, that he came to make God known, that he came in human flesh to make God visible. The point I'm trying to make is that we serve the same purpose as creation in Christ. (laughs) We're here to do the same thing that creation and Christ do for, for God. We're here to reveal him. We're here to make him known. We're here to make him visible. Now, the thing that makes that difficult is sin. That's right. The thing that makes that impossible, unless we know Christ, is sin. And as I've defined sin many, many times, sin is when we ignore God in the world that he made. And so the world and everything in it belongs to him. He created it all to reveal himself to people like us. We're here to fill the world up with his glory. Sin is when we say, God, I'm not interested in that. Mm-hmm. I know this is yours. I know it all belongs to you, but I'm going to live my life how I'm going to live my life. And we're all guilty of this at times, right? And again, this is the struggle of sin, that that we would live for our glory instead of God's glory, that we would live for our pleasure instead of his pleasure, that, that we would live for the fleeting glories of this world instead of the eternal glory of God. 
Lane, you said it earlier in the podcast. I want to repeat it. That is a wasted life. Mm. Oh, man. It's a wasted life. When you live for you, you are wasting your life. When you live for the temporary things of this world, whatever they are, money, power, fame, accolades, whatever it is, that is a wasted life. And all I can think about it, as, as, and I was thinking about this as I'm prepping, but all I can think about is the person who has to stand before God mm-hmm. one day and answer for that. Yeah. Like how tragic will this be for, for a human being, a finite being made by creator God for the purpose of glorifying him in his world to have to stand before God and go, yeah, I wasted my whole life mm. because I didn't do that. Instead of living a life that made you look big, I, I lived in a way that made you look really small. Instead of living a life that, that made you visible, I, I lived a life that kept you hidden. Instead of living for your eternal glory, I lived for all these glories that are no more. Mm. Like, my gosh, man, it's a waste of life. We gotta feel the weight of this, yeah. you know, that we've been made for so much more than, than what is right in front of us each and every day. And when you know that eternity is ahead of you. Like you start to live differently in the world right now. Mm. And so just back to, back to the heart of the question, if the glory of God is going to be the theme of our prayers, it has to be the theme of our life. Mm. Like we have to know that this is our purpose and that Christ accomplished work to save us and to redeem us and to restore us back to that purpose. And us living for the glory of God is simply a response to what he has done on our behalf And so my encouragement to our listeners would be this. When you pray, you need to ask for God's help in this. Mm. Like when you pray, I I would say you go to him and you go, God, make me mindful of your glory. Grow my concern for your glory. Empower me to live for your glory. Help me not to get caught up in living for for the fleeting glories of this world. God, I do not want to waste my life. I want to show up in your presence one day and know that I can say with confidence that I lived a life that made you look really big in your world. And so I, I would say, again, make it the theme of your life. This is your purpose. Don't waste your life. Mm, that's so good. I literally have nothing to add to that. <laughs> like, I, right. because, and I, I do even appreciate the, the weight of that because we can lose this, especially in our culture, because the name of the game is make yourself great. That's right. And, dude, if anybody gets in your way, yeah. you take them out. Yep. You follow your heart and and you do you. Yeah. So so the cost of that then mm-hmm. is is that kind of a dialogue in front of the creator of the universe That's at the right. end of our life. That's right. That's a heavy weight to bear. That's right. And I just feel like I feel like you captured that well. And that's 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 what we have to acknowledge is is at stake. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say it like this before we button it up. It would be much better for you to ask for God's help in that now then you stand yeah. before him one day and answer That's for why right. you didn't live the life he put you here to live. That's right. So make it a point to pray for this each and every day so that it becomes the theme mm-hmm. of your life, the very glory of God. Let's make it our greatest concern. Mm. That's so good. That's so good. All right, well, that's a good place to put a pen in it. Anything else? I think I'm good. I think we did it, Lane. All right, dude. Yeah. It was fun, man. Yeah. Good way to come good back to have to you the back. Beach. That's all right. right. But hey, listen, thank you all for listening. And as you go, we want you to know that we love you, we are here for you, and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pursuit with James Griffin. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll never miss an episode. If you have questions about the message, the scriptures, or faith in general, you can send them to us by texting the word QUESTION to the number 22722. For more information about our church or this podcast, please visit crosspointcity.com or follow us online at Cross Point City. If you found value in this podcast, we would love it if you took time to like it and share it with a friend. Doing that will help more people know and follow Jesus. And finally, we want to invite you to join us each week for one of our gatherings in person or live on YouTube. We hope to see you soon.